am Amy Axelson, joined by my mom, Barbara Axelson, and this is Juvenile Svengali's. Have some fun with us and join us in our search for what happened to my mom's grandfather. Welcome to Juvenile Svengali's, where we find out what happened to Byron Wadsworth Culver, Princeton graduate, successful businessman, asylum inmate, and Juvenile Svengali. On this episode of Juvenile Svengali's... Drowsy, sleepy... Santanelli? She yeah. was... Uh, that's completely an alias, and I haven't figured out where he decided to call himself that. Last time on Juvenile Svengali's... says it was the home of the magician Bancroft. Excited the admiration of every boy in town. And he died. There's this flint hypnotist, but he kind of is more of a legal person. Okay. Then there's this Tyndall guy, who is some kind of Northwestern professor, just not good at it, right? But then there emerges Santanelli. Advancing upon him, he waved his hands before his eyes three or four times. Back to Juvenile Spengali's and what Professor Hester, Byron, and Lum are up to. So my mother's grandfather has gathered a crowd of boys and a reporter into a parlor. Catch him so he won't fall, he cried, and two or three of the boys threw their arms around the body of the subject whose limbs were stiffening. He began to totter, and it required all of the strength of his supporters to hold him up. Byron has gathered a crowd of boys and, and a reporter into this kid's house, a parlor, to the visiting newspaper man from Chicago, right? Yes. And the one thing that popped into my head was, like, how appropriate is this? Pinch him, commanded Lum in a business-like tone. Half a dozen pairs of muscular fingers were outstretched and closed upon the flesh of the subject. It did not require a field glass to see that the pinching was performed vigorously. Is this a bad discussion to have or no? Not a thing? I don't think so. And accompanied minors with reporters all by themselves. They can just run with any story they want to. Yep. Go nuts. Yep. Damn. Yeah. You've got all these young kids alone doing these displays for this reporter, which I think is odd. But the subject never moved. Lum stepped in front of the rigid form again, and clapping his hands together, commanded him to awaken. The eyes opened, and a shudder ran through his body. He was fully awake in a moment. The reporter, being alone in the parlor with this group of children, I assume they're all boys, performing these moves, these pinches, and whatever else they were doing, is uh, an event that certainly would not fly today. Then Byron took a piece of glass from his pocket. It shone brilliantly. He was preparing to get to work on a subject and was repeating slowly but distinctly, drowsy, sleepy. When the young host, whose face had worn a look of anxiety for several minutes, announced that he would not entertain any longer. Mama might come home and she would not like it, he said. Then they have this line, Claire's relationship with hypnotism. The record is so brief that it has apt to be forgotten. So this got me wondering, what do they mean by that? Like, what could have happened before? The other boys understood what he meant, and without a protest, left the house and rejoined the rest of the school outside. There were not less than 100 boys out on the lawn, and half of them were engaged in making passes at the other half in an endeavor to put them to sleep. How successful any of them would have been can only be conjectured, for the reappearance of the real hypnotist served to put an end to their own efforts. I was looking at and reading some of the stories, but particularly how, what was it about Lum and your grandfather, Byron, who hypnotized a guy in the park and then forgot about him. Yes. And came back a couple, a couple hours later and there he was still leaning against the tree or something. Mm -hmm. He went promptly into hysteric. Lum and Byron both said they could overcome seven out of ten of the subjects they practiced on. We have done that all the time since we have been practicing, said Byron proudly. I have discovered Lum. There are two possibilities what Lum actually is. Most of the boys named Lum. It's somehow it means Columbus. There is another kind of Lum, and it's L-U-M-A-N, Lumen. It's one of these things where it's a family name. That, like Robinson Crusoe, you know, you gave a, you give a kid a family name instead of a first name. Uh -huh. 
And so there are at least two possibilities of what Lum could be short for. And of course, any nickname has the possibility that the family just decided to use it without being a short for anything. Sure. So I've been trying to work out whether or not there is any record of a kid from the Midwest named Columbus Scottville or not. Did you ever work out whether or not anything happened to him? He's tough. There's not much to him, right? Except not much to him other than that they paint such a cool picture of him. He's got these gray eyes, like white hair. After the principal, young Scottville is particularly proud of his feat of partly overcoming the professional hypnotist who travels under the name of Silver, but who is really an Eau Claire man named Kepler. Both boys want a chance at Professor Hester, for they have decided after consultation that he would be an easy mark. But neither has had the courage to ask him to submit to a sitting. And for me to re after all these years of mystery, you know, and for me to find this crazy article and have them describe him as a boy, I don't know, it was just uh, kind of cool. Both lads got their first hypnotic inspiration when Santinelli was here about a month ago. Santinelli is a man with the face of a tragedian, and he took Eau Claire by storm. This is a description of one of his performances from 1897. This is from the Morning Record, Traverse City, Michigan, Wednesday, July 14, 1897. So this is the summer before his Juvenos Vengales came out. A fair audience greeted Santinelli in Seisberg's Grand last night. The celebrated hypnotist introduced many new and original features, and all of them were on the order of mysterious, strange, and interesting. The spectacle of several prominent citizens in the act of washing clothes, juggling Indian clubs, sailing through the air, and doing all sorts of strange and peculiar feats at the will of Santinelli is something that is sure to attract the investigation of the most skeptical. Yet, Santinelli makes his subjects do his bidding, playing baseball, singing hymns, riding horses, and many other wonderful things. Things are exacted of the subjects with with a realism that is surprising. With trained subjects, these performances might seem feasible, but when prominent and well-known citizens bend to the will of the hypnotist, there is certainly merit to the entertainment. The statue posing introduces numerous comical situations that are alike strange and amusing. Skeptics may say what they like, but the fact remains that these feats are performed and the subjects are ignorant of the means as the audience. The entertainments are worthy of large audiences. But yeah. Mark has figured out, can you please explain the Santinelli thing? Uh, okay, let me hear. Santinelli? He yeah. was, uh, that's completely an alias, and I haven't figured out where he decided to call himself that. I wonder if he, like, adopted some tenor's name. But he seems to have been the son of a guy called Abram Laurier. He's a quasi-doctor without an MD. Very interesting history. He's the son of a guy called Isaac. Isaac, who is the grandfather here, he emigrated to the New World from a part of the world that kind of no longer exists. Uh, it may have been absorbed into what is today Latvia. They're from an ethnic group that was always a minority. They're Jewish, on top of it all, and had always had trouble because of anti-Semitism wherever they went. Possibly the respelling, the way they spell that L-O-R-Y-E-A may have helped this guy exactly what their origins were. And so they end up in the New World and Abram, which is uh, the next generation. He is a really interesting character. He did a lot of things. He launched a company promoting patent medicine. There's something called Unkweed. Unkweed is a generic term for uh, pain-killing, like mm -hmm. arthritis. While he is up in Oregon, he found a hospital for the insane. <laughs> Really? Where? With Where? James, with James Hawthorne. And this hospital for the insane is still there, although it has changed its name a couple of times. It's a little, it's a little weird. There's Mr. Abram with his hospital for the insane. One of his, see, the co-founder of the Oregon Hospital for the Insane. This is like launched in 1859 as Oregon Hospital. The Oregon State Insane Asylum, which is today's Oregon State Hospital, sucked it up or something. So now it's like all together. He eventually left it. Uh, he founded the hospital for the insane with a business partner and apparently sold the business to the partner. And after he did that. 
I'm not entirely sure how he does this, but he ends up familiar with the Turkish path. Of because course. Because one, one thing that he did was travel extensively in the Middle East. After traveling around, he wanders back to the West Coast and decided to set one up. And it's on Grant Avenue in San Francisco, and apparently it's no longer there, but you can look at, you can walk over to the address and just take a look at it. Mm-hmm. And he started a second one on Post Street. You know what this is? These Turkish baths are not very far away from the modern opera house on Van Ness Avenue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that Gloria, uh, he has several children, and the eldest one turns out to be this hypnotist who called himself Sandra Nelly, and that's how this intersects. Eldest child, James H. Gloria, or Laurier, probably. Mm-hmm. 1962 to 1920, you see that his alias is Santanelli. This is the Santanelli guy. It was a really big book that Santanelli wrote, and you can see that he actually signs it. This uh, is the one. So that there is some bizarre connection to you somehow. Which is, to me? Yeah. That's purely serious, but it's suggestive. If you look at the children, there's this second child called William D, and it says death unknown, and I did a little bit of Googling, and I discovered that he's in the record of American loss at war, and his find a grave. Uh, states that he died in the Philippines in the Spanish-American War. He died in what would eventually become where the capital city, Manila, would be founded. And I was born there. I know where he has to have died. And the only reason that it, he's, his death is unknown is that legally he, they probably couldn't find his remains to send them back. Mm-hmm. To see if there's any record of Santanelli's North American tour. I have Montana, Kansas, Mississippi. Yeah. And they're interesting, and he's just loved and... You know, he really, the the women's club absolutely loves him. And he's handsome and he's debonair and he's not a putt. But there was one article we uncovered where Santanelli got caught. Police see through Santanelli's trick. Found the subject supposed to be asleep for a week, very much awake. Caught him eating at one time and at another beating time with his foot. This is from Willimantic, Connecticut. You've got ten of them like fumbling around and not really doing a very good job and he's burying people. Santanelli really comes out as this kind of rock star. Yeah. Yeah. He's able to kind of pull it together. Willimantic people convinced that professed hypnotist resorts to deception in his exhibition work. So in Connecticut, they weren't buying it. Santanelli closed a week's engagement here last night and it was a disastrous in more ways than one. The journal's expose of his work capped the climax and the alleged hypnotist at once left town with his manager for New York, where he said he would straighten affairs. He left behind him six of his alleged subjects who are without money to pay their board bills or get out of town. To many of the people of Willimantic, the journal's expose was a surprise. To others, it was not. For they had been watching the man who was supposed to sleep for a week and had found him very much awake. Captain of Police Hill House now has in his office the half-eaten sandwich, which was found in the bed of the sleeping subject. And two of his officers are certain that the sleeper was fed with more more or less regularity by the attendants who watched over him. The subject who was chosen to do the week's sleep here was James Mahoney, who was mentioned in the confession of Minwa. Sandelli's father, Abraham or Abram, he went by both. And the bathhouse, which was, I like how the article says, on the sleazy fringes of Chinatown. <laughs> I wonder if you like adopted some tenor's name. But this Amy Crocker, she's from Sacramento, and she's one of these people who she seems to have become famous because she basically married everyone. Amy Isabella Crocker, five marriages, to say nothing of all the people that she took up with without marrying them. <laughs> <laughs> And one of the things that she did was she got fascinated with tattoos and then she tattooed herself all over the place. Which of course in that era was absolutely scandalous. Yes. yes. But supposedly uh, she lived in Shanghai and so she was associated with Sentinelli's father because she was over at this bathhouse of his. <laughs> <laughs> Which was on Post Street. Oh my god, look at that hat. She's got like a animal on her head. 
Mahoney did not like the job and only consented to begin it after a long argument with Santinelli. The latter, to show, as he said, that there was no fraud in the test, applied to Captain Hillhouse for two policemen to keep guard over Mahoney. Officers Hastings and Paul House were assigned to the case. Mahoney was hypnotized Monday night and was put into bed placed with the orchestra of the opera house. He was partially dressed and was covered with a white sheet, while a blanket lay at his feet in case he should get cold. Mahoney caught eating. Everything went all right until Tuesday when the officer Paul House became convinced that Mahoney was not asleep. He determined to keep the close watch and caution Officer Hastings to do likewise. Presently, Mahoney was noticed to grow restless. Close to him sat another member of Santinelli's company who was eating some lunch. Hastings left the room for a minute and when he returned, he found the bed clothing disarranged. Drops of water on the sheets and Mahoney moving his jaws, though eating. Several times, the alleged sleeping man had his face in the blanket and put his hands to his mouth. Hastings tried to put the blanket down to see what Mahoney was doing, but the sleeping man clung to it. When Hastings was relieved, he told Paul House that he had seen it, had seen and put him on his guard. Paul House saw Mahoney feeling about the, in the bed as if he was trying to find something which he had lost. While feeling about, Mahoney fell out of bed. Paul House at once went to pick him up and in straightening out the sheets, found a piece of sandwich in the bed. Yeah. Oh, that's his mother. Oh, she's the Bohemian princess. Yeah. And the yeah. Oh, says, mm. oh, I love her. Oh, she's fabulous. Okay. So I this is her. kind of a peripheral association with uh, Laurier and hypnotism and all. But what she's doing <laughs> is that she did, she did it for real. She went off and got herself tattooed while she was traveling in some of these places. Scarcely more than a good-sized mouthful was left of the bread, but spread upon it was some finely chopped meat. You've been feeding this man, said Paul House as he picked up the bread and showed it to the watcher. Where'd you get that? exclaimed Sentinel assistant. In feigned astonishment, found it in the bed, said Paul House. Someone has been trying to ruin us, answered the watchman. They tried it once before. Nothing was made public regarding the discovery and everything was seemingly all right until Thursday night when Santinelli aroused Mahoney for a moment. The latter at once became refractory. You've got to wake me up, he said. I'm not going to stay here any longer. I'm sick. I'll die if I have to stay here. You are not going to quit now and make a fool of us, are you? asked Santinelli. My stomach's knotted out, replied Mahoney. I'm sick of this job and I'm going to get out. You'll be all right, responded the hypnotist. There are only two days more of it. I'll take care of you. Sneer for Santinelli. You'll take care of me a lot, you will, sneered Mahoney. I'm going to get out, I tell you. Heiress, princess, mystic, and author was a tattooed um. woman. The Python Princess. She also seems to have written a lot of memoirs about wandering around in would have been for Westerners really exotic places. And she would return and have parties in San Francisco where she kept intersecting with some of these people, including Santinelli. Then Santinelli got mad. If you don't sleep your week out, you won't get any money and can walk home, he is alleged to have said. I'll not stay here, said Mahoney. I'd rather walk home than be taken home in a coffin. The indignant subject, however, eventually quieted and persuaded to go on with his sleep. Once he waked to complain that gas was escaping and that it made him sick, in, in spite of the statement by Santinelli that Mahoney was perfectly unconscious of all that was going on. Mahoney's trouble was undoubtedly due to the close watch kept upon him by the police. What does the father, Abram, and his association with an insane asylum. Because, Brenna, didn't you say that your grandfather was put away? Yeah, very much. Well, yes. the, the weird thing is, if you look at the father, Abram, he's listed as having three kids, James, William, D, and Amy, who may not actually be the, the famous rich Amy. William D, the one who died in the Philippines, right? Mm -hmm. And he has a brother named William, of unknown birth, uh, no middle name, but their dates overlap. So it's not one of these things where a much older child died right away, and so the family has another boy, and so they name him the same name. Mm. Because both Williams were alive at the same time. The one we can't work out died in 1887. Okay. The one who died in the Philippines was born in 1864. So they would have been children together. This is sheer coincidence. And I was talking to this old guy here in my town who is a retired cop. And he's done a lot of these checking genealogy and so on. And he said to me... They would not leave him for a moment and refused to read or sleep, though urged to do so by Santinelli's assistants, who were on watch with them. This wakefulness on their part made it extremely difficult to smuggle food to Mahoney and caused him to rebel against sleeping. And he said, you know, one 
possibility that might explain that is the William with no middle name could have been born with a birth defect and could have been kept private by the family, by the older people in the family, the fathers and the grandfathers and so on. And when the younger boy was born, he became the public version of that one, but there are actually two of them. Which is a very interesting idea, especially since the father, Abraham, founded a an insane asylum, the oh, Oregon right. Hospital for the Insane, which even today has a, a reputation for, her, for having been very forward-looking and humane in their treatment of their patients in an era when patients like that were not really treated very well. And that was a terrific movement in Wisconsin. They did it in Eau Claire. They did it in the Madison area. There are five or six counties I can think of during that era that started these asylums where the inmates were given fresh air, exercise, the opportunity to work the mm-hmm. land and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. be with nature. The, the one in uh, Marshfield, where my grandfather was, was in existence all the way until the 60s when they started you know, looking at what they were doing. He, he died in 65, but I think he you know, got the good part of it and not the tail end. Word. So do you Got think it. there's a connection between the Marshfield one and the Oregon one? I do, because it was a big movement, a big national Do you think movement. it started in Oregon? It, it certainly could have, yeah, yeah. That he was wide awake all the time was proved in a number of ways. Two or three times when he was unobserved and he sat up in bed and other times half opened his eyes and watched his visitors who were leaving his bedside. Mahoney cut out by jokes. A circus passed the opera house one day. Because we found Santanelli's book, didn't we? we oh, found- I got two of them. You do? Yeah. You sent me one and I sent you one. You're just bigger. Mine's more like a, mine's more like a pamphlet. This is more of like what he would have passed out to like Byron. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you know, at the end of the show, oh. would you like to buy something? Come here, yeah. little boy. Let me just, you know, show yeah. you some stuff. It would have been literature. Yeah. And it would have been, an, and it's not too long, and it would have been enough for a 12 year old boy to inhale. Yeah. Wow. Before she devotes a few pages of her memoirs to legendary te- Japanese tattoo artist Hori Chio who may have given her at least one tattoo, as he did with so many other adventurous Western aristocrats. Which means that the tattoos that she sported were actually for real. Right. They're not fake imitations of what looks like Orientalism. She actually got them from Asian people. And could this be some kind of like group of bullied aristocrats that went around and, you know, they, they kind of they kind of belong to their own exclusive club and they had similar tattoos, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that some of these people, <laughs> met in San Francisco at the Turkish Baths run by Santanelli's dad. Oh my god. And the stream of the music were easily heard at the sleeper's bed. Mahoney was a little off his guard, for he began to beat time with the music at his foot until he recalled himself. At one time, he really fell asleep. Wow. So Byron, these two little boys, they heard of him and they idolized him and they wanted to be, they wanted to meet him and learn from him. It's really interesting bridge to I, I don't know what this whatever world. this yeah yeah this, so so <laughs> little old Eau Claire is part of a, a bigger uh, scene and, like a movement. several times he was overcome by joke made by visitors to his bedside that he could not restrain himself from smiling he had to hide his face by rolling over on the pillow Santinelli had a hard time here he did scarcely any business and the police were on guard demanded their pay Saturday night there was not enough money in the box office to pay them they succeeded in getting their pay though before Santinelli left town because the thing is that I told you Santinelli himself lived at the address in the Turkish bath for some years. Really? You lived at the Turkish house? Yeah, like, you know one of those things like uh, where it's a very, very large building and mm-hmm. part of it might actually be residential? You know, I, and just for one of it, it means something to me, you know? So yeah. it's it's not just nothing. It's not just poking around. It actually means something. Well, you know, there's a peripheral connection to me. Santinelli's younger brother died where I was born. <laughs> oh, look at this. I've just figured out what Santinelli's middle initial is for. What's that? If you go back to that Wikipedia article on the father, the partner with whom he founded the Oregon Hospital for the Insane yeah. was named James Hawthorne. Okay. So he named his son James Hawthorne Laurier. And he was <laughs> the son was a clerk at the Turkish Bath. That's why he was living there. Oh, well, there you go. Before he went into hypnotism. Okay, well, this is all getting yeah, so much clearer. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> his son, James Hawthorne Lorberry, was a clerk at the bath. He disowned his father and left to exhibit his wonderful feats of hypnotism across the country as Professor Sansonelli. Wow. And then they yeah. all hated each other. Abraham Lorberry's obituary because they're hysterical. Yeah. One of them leaves, he leaves a gun to one of his kids so that his, his kid no, shoots No, that's the up. wife. It's a mother. Oh. It's the, he leaves, yes, yeah, but it's the mother wishes that her son was. <laughs> In case you didn't catch that, Santinelli's stepmother left Santinelli a gun in her will so he could shoot himself with it. <laughs> oh my god. I'm sorry, we got we got a little sidetracked there, but that was a fun little another I'm sorry, we rabbit holed a lot there, but it was it was it's so fun to rabbit hole for a minute. Mark is fun. Mark is so fun. We're we're gonna get back to the playground. Okay. Back back to Juvenile's Fun Gallery. The city it ought to be remembered is partial to that sort of performances and has a record in hypnotism that is not so brief that it is apt to be forgotten. It was the home of the magician Bancroft, who died a few months ago, and whose feats have excited the admiration and envy of every boy in town. This is um, some descriptions of the performances of Bancroft. The Daily Times of Raleigh, North Carolina on Monday evening, September 13th, 1897. Bancroft the Magician, no theatrical entertainment of modern times has attracted more widespread attention that, than that given by Bancroft the Magician, who with his lavish production magic, scenic grandeur, and mirth-provoking illusions, appears at the Academy of Music Friday night. Bancroft's fascinating manner as an entertainer and his skill, ingenuity, and almost reckless extravagance has completely revolutionized the art of magic. He has brought before the public the most elaborate and interesting program ever attempted in a magical entertainment. He carries two carloads of the finest scenery and furniture that has been exhibited on the stage, and his program is replete with novel features which he brings here fresh from his successful engagement in New York. A unique addition to his repertoire is a reproduction of Egyptian magic as disclosed by recent excavations in the land of the pyramids, a new representation of a Hindu occultism, and many thrilling and novel illusions including Bancroft's famous achievement of apparently transforming a charming winsome maiden into a wild Nubian lion. Others were critical of Bancroft. That he lacked a certain finish. And finish? Yeah, he wasn't like smoothness. Ah, certain quality which had much to do with the popularity of Hermann. Telling Amy that I discovered that the Seventh Ward School was established in the summer of 1897, so it was barely a few months old when all of this happened. Oh, brand new. Professor Gross, superintendent of schools, says that the practice has got to stop. We will not tolerate it, he said to the correspondent of the Chronicle. What are your objections to the practice by the boys? The superintendent was asked. I had not thought of formulating an answer to that question, said the superintendent. But, without reflection, I should say that one of the best reasons for stopping it as a practice is that our school system is intended to broaden and develop the mind, and that hypnotism is intended to have an opposite effect. That I consider a good reason to put an end to it. But there is an additional reason. It is a bad thing, not only for these boys who are practicing the art, but for all of their comrades in the schools. President, oh, President Emmett Horan of the school board. There's a, there's a dormitory in University of Wisconsin that's named for him. I've been there. Do you really believe they possess any real hypnotic power, Mr. Gross was asked. I do, was the quiet rejoinder. There has been a suspicion that the boys who have been acting as their subjects yielded as a matter of form and for the purpose of enabling the boys who pass as hypnotists to get a reputation they do not deserve. I know several persons who have seen them and who are entirely satisfied that they possess powers that are simply extraordinary in such young children. Judge Bailey has seen them and he is satisfied of the genuineness of their powers and the judge could not easily be deceived. The craze is the talk of all Eau Claire, and inasmuch as it has its origin in the manifestations of the schoolboys who are 
practiced in the yard, in their homes, and vacant lots, and wherever they can find a crowd, the school board may take a firm stand against a continuance of manifestations of any sort, in or around the public schools, or by pupils of the schools anywhere in the city. The newspaper The Argus on October 16, 1897, picked up the Chronicle article, and there was one paragraph at the very end of it which really piqued my interest and expanded on something. Both boys attended the performance of Santinelli and those of another hypnotist who called himself Tyndall, and they appear to have procured some literature with both men had to sell. Whatever the books contained, the fact remains that very soon after Santinelli left the city, they began to practice hypnotism. In the same newspaper, there a couple paragraphs before, I had to go back because I read it again and then this is where it gets really, really interesting. This paragraph really caught my attention. Three years ago, a sensational action which had hypnotism as its basis attracted the attention of the country to Eau Claire. Dr. George Pickin and his son Asagal were arrested upon complaint of a young woman named Mabel Briggs, who accused them of having exercised a hypnotic influence over her. She explained that one night while she was riding past, well, we'll get to this later, but the thing about it is Mabel Briggs, the name Briggs caught my attention because my great-grandmother's maiden name was Briggs in Eau Claire. What's happening here? What's going on? Eau Claire is one of the most substantial towns in northwest Wisconsin. Most of its 20,000 inhabitants are concerned in one way or another in the great lumbering interests, the foundries, factories, or mills, which make it a humming business place. The men are of the hard-headed, practical, common-sense sort who make such enterprises successful. They have little time to give to the consideration of the mysteries of occultism and less inclination to believe in such things. But for weeks, Eau Claire has been stirred by a criminal charge preferred against two of its citizens by a young woman who bases her accusation on the allegation that these men accomplished her ruin solely by means of the hypnotic influence over her which they possessed and exercised. Edna Mabel Briggs is the daughter of Joseph Briggs, an Englishman who had lived in Eau Claire for years. He is an engineer at the City Water Works, frugal and thrifty, and has accumulated a comfortable property. His daughter is not yet 17 years of age. She is a bright, pretty girl with black hair and eyes and the glow of healthy blood in her cheeks. Her manner is vivacious and attractive. She has attended the public schools of Eau Claire and was to have entered the high school in September. This is the story which she told to District Attorney Frolio, which led to the arrest of Dr. J. W. Pickin and his son, Azagal. On the next episode of Juvenile Svengali's, We're actually going to go to Eau Claire. I'm so excited about this. The Vitopathic Institute. She traveled past. Okay. So Myron Briggs got kicked out of his house. A hypnotic green parrot, an abduction, and a possible double murder. Uh, also long sentences with lots of um, clauses. I love clauses. Join us as we uncover what happened to my mom's grandfather in the bizarre world and colorful cast of characters we discover in the most unlikely of places, the Gilded Age of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Thank you for listening to Juvenile Svengali's. We hope to see you next time. This is Amy Axelson. And I'm Barb Axelson, and this is Juvenile Svengali's. A special thank you to Mark Glenn, TF. Music by Jason Shaw of Audionautics.com. Simon Sounds, Dude Awesome, and Frankie of Freesound.org. Thank you for listening to Juvenile Svengali's. Juvenile Svengali's is written edited and produced by Amy Axelson. If you want to see 
Santinelli's pamphlet that he passed out to the boys, visit us at www.juvenilesvengalis.com or visit us on Instagram at Juvenile Svengalis and Facebook, Juvenile Svengalis. Okay, thanks for listening. Bye.